Okay. <laughs> oh, a computer stuff. Okay, so now let's uh we are we're looking at the Isaiah text. Let's um everyone get out your Masoretic text, your your Hebrew Bibles, and turn to uh Isaiah chapter 49, verses 20 to 26. And right here is the text. Okay, so let's look at these verses and see what Isaiah has to say. Let's look at verse 20 and 21 here. So he says. Od Yomru Beaznaich Bene Shikulaich Tsarli Hamakom Geshali Ve Esheva. Okay, the, the children which you will have after you have um, after you have lost the other, okay, uh, shall say again in your ear, the place is straight for me. Give place to me that I may dwell. Okay, and then it goes on in verse 21. It says, Vamarte bilvavech mi yalad li et ele, the ani shahula, the galmuda gola, the sura the ele, mi gidel hen ani nisharti, nisharti levadi ele. Fo afo ahem. Okay, so uh, then you will say in your heart, "Who has begotten me?" Seeing I have lost my children and and am desolate, a captive in removing in removing to and fro. And who hath brought up these? Behold, I was left alone. These were they. Where had they been? Okay, where are they? Right. These, where are they? Okay, so these verses here in Isaiah 49, verses 20 to 21, they contain several words that are rich in meaning. And, uh, for example, the words uh, here, B'nai Shihulaich, okay? And that is the, the children of your bereavement, okay? So it implies a sense of loss, and as if the children were born after a period of mourning or deprivation. And the term um, shikul, where is that? Um, I must have a typo in the, I must have had a typo there. I was wondering about that. Okay, um, that is, oh, okay. So what I did was I looked at the root word here. Um, and I spelled it out, and I forgot that I did that. That that root word shikul, okay, um, it's related to the um, to the meaning bereavement, and it's often used in the context of losing children. And this can be seen as a metaphor for the people of Israel who have experienced a loss, but are now witnessing a rebirth of restoration. And then we see here it says tsar lihamakom, okay. Now this is narrow for me. This place is narrow, too narrow for me. And it indicates a situation where growth or increase has occurred to the point of needing more space. So this can symbolize the expansion of community or nation and reflecting a positive change from desolation to abundance. Okay, and then this this word here, the esheva. Okay, and that that means I will be left. You're referring to the feeling of being abandoned or alone. You know, so this verse. Um, emphasizes the that despite being left alone, the speaker in this case, Zion, will still save her children. And the the phrase, mi yeled li et ele, okay, right here, that phrase I picked out because it means who has borne me of these, you know, and it seems like a question. And it reflects astonishment and wonder at the unexpected increase of their population, as if the speaker cannot believe the transformation has taken place. And so that this can remind us of the surprising ways in which growth and blessing can occur even when we least suspect them. Now, in verses 20 here, 20 and 21, okay, in the Hebrew Bible, speak to the theme of restoration and expansion. And the New Testament text 
there are some parallels that are related to the growth of the early early body of believers. I was thinking about that and uh, the astonishment of the growth of the community and the need for more space can, can be paralleled to the rapid spread of Yeshua in the first century that's seen in the book of Acts. And so I want to look at a few places in the book of Acts where it speaks of believers just multiplying and the message spreading beyond the Jewish communities and, and on to the Gentiles. And so let's look at this verse here from Acts 13, verses 42 to 49. And it says, And when the Jews were gone out of the synagogue, the Gentiles besought that these words might be preached to them the next Shabbat, the next Sabbath. Now, when the congregation was broken up, many of the Jews and religious proselytes followed Paul and Barnabas, who, speaking to them, persuaded them to continue in the grace of God. And the next Sabbath day came almost the whole city. Okay, so almost the whole city gathered to hear the word of God. Okay, so, but when the Jews saw the multitudes, they were filled with envy and spoke, spake against those things which were spoken by Paul, contradicting and blaspheming. So when then Paul and Barnabas waxed bold and said, it was necessary that the word of God should first have been spoken to you, but seeing you put it from you and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, lo, we turn to the Gentiles. And for so hath the Lord commanded us, saying, I have set thee to be a light to the Gentiles, that thou shouldst be for salvation unto the ends of the earth. Okay, so uh, we got the Isaiah verse right here, right? And um, and then when the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and glorified the word of the Lord. As many as were ordained to eternal life believed, and the word of the Lord was published throughout all the region. Okay, so um, you know what we can see here is this significant expansion of the body of believers to the non-Jewish peoples. And then these were those who were in the synagogue learning about the God of Israel. Note, Gentiles were in the synagogues learning about the God of Israel. You know, so this expansion fulfills the prophecy of Isaiah that the servant of the Lord would be a light unto the Gentiles. That's Isaiah 49 verse 6, which is quoted in Acts 13 verse 47 here. And as part of God's purpose was to bring salvation to the ends of the earth. And this is how this would be accomplished. And so these these connections between the Hebrew Bible and the New Testament text highlight the continuity of God's plan for redemption and the nature of his promises which extend beyond Israel and to the nations. And the fulfillment of these prophecies in the New Testament serves as a testament to the faithfulness of God's word and the transformative power of his actions throughout history. According to these uh, scriptures, there is great hope for both the Jew and the Gentile, and this parallels Isaiah from the sense that Zion has lost everything. And nevertheless, against all odds, in the midst of her bereavement, like what we're reading here, it, there will be a new generation through which her life can continue. And th this is a theme that begins in the Torah, how Sarah was barren and could not bear children, and there seemed to be no hope for Sarah and Abraham. So, But there was always hope in the power of God to overcome the troubles of this world. So the scriptures speak of the abundant life and eternal life that is a gift of God in the Messiah Yeshua. So these things are, are um, promised of God to us, to both the Jew and the non-Jew. And so in these things, we can place our hope and we place our hope in the God of Israel. Okay, so next let's look at verses 22 to 23, okay? So, um, let's read verse 22. So it says, Ko amar Adonai Elohim, hine esa el goyim yadi, ve'el amim arim nisi, ve'heviu b'neich b'chotzen uvotayich al Okay, so, thus says the Lord God, Behold, I will lift up my hand to the Gentiles and set up my standard to the people, and they will bring their sons in their arms, and their daughters will be carried on their shoulders. Okay, and then it goes in verse 23, it says, 
Vehayu Melachim on Om Naich Ushortechem Menikotaich Apayim Eretz Ishtachavulach Ve Efer Raglaich Yela Chekhu Ve Yadat Ki Ani Adonai Asher Lo Yavushu Kovai. Okay, so um, in verse 23, and kings will be your nursing fathers and your queens your nursing mothers, and they will bow down to you and their, with their face to the earth and lick the dust off of your feet. And you will know that I am the Lord, for they will not be ashamed that wait for me. Okay, and so here, Isaiah 22 to 23 contains profound imagery, I thought, you know, profound imagery and promises that have significant implications. You know, for example, this phrase, um, I will lift up my hands to the nations, and that, that is um, Esa el Goyim um, Yadi. Okay, I will lift up my hands to the nations, suggests this gesture, uh, gesture of summoning or attention gathering, you know, attracting someone's attention. So this again, you know, like, you know, so this again suggests that the God, the Lord God is reaching out to the nations and inviting the nations to participate in his plan. You know, we see the banner, Nisi, my banner, right? Um, this is mentioned in Isaiah 49, verse 22. And the it has a, I, I felt it has this Torah context, okay? Because we read of this concept of the banner being lifted, and it's mentioned in Exodus 17, verse 15, where Moshe built an altar after a victory with the Amalekites and named it Adonai Nisi, you know, the Lord, my banner, and the Lord is my banner. Okay, so this was a declaration of God's protection and leadership over the Israelites. Okay, so we, we see this banner thing here that's going on and the banner is a rallying point for the troops a symbol of gathering of and of unity right and so here uh, it represents god's call to the nations to gather around um his purpose and his people right and so and uh, then again this this phrase uh this phrase here and it says vehaviu banayik bechotsen okay this <clears throat> this phrase, and I will bring your sons in the folds of your clothes or in your bosom, you know, and again, this conveys the sense of intimacy and care as one would carry a, a cherished child close to their heart. It reflects the tender care with which the nations will bring God's people back to him. Isaiah 49 verse 23, we read, it says, um, oh, yeah, no, 23. Okay. So, uh, Melachim, and then Om Naich, okay? And so this is from the sense of the kings being nursing fathers, right? They will nurse you. And so again, this indicates, and it, and it, this, indicates this reversal of roles where the powerful serve the previously oppressed, right? And showing the extent of God's influence upon the nations and restoration of his people. And we note also the queens will be nursing mothers as well. And that uh, the, the text states, it states here, um, right here, the afar reglei, that you will, uh, the, the dust of the feet, they will, they will lick, right? And um, right here, they will lick. And, which is an expression of utmost reverence and humility, right? And, and the purpose of this is God says, he says, Vayadat ki ani Adonai, and you will know that I am the Lord, right? And we notice how these things are done for the glory of God, right? Everything that he's doing here is because of, it says, so that you will know that I am the Lord, Okay, and so again, you know, these are these are done for the glory of God, and we note that the New Testament text, according to the book of Acts, the Gentiles were 
drawing near to the God of Israel in the synagogue service. Okay, and so um, there I, I created like a little list that indicates how the Gentiles were attending synagogue. Okay, and so let's look at these different verses here. And again, you know, this is for the glory of God because this is happening already because of what Isaiah had prophesied, right? And uh, here in Acts 13, verse 42, it states that Paul and Barnabas were leaving the synagogue and the Gentiles invited them to speak further about these things on the next Shabbat. In verse Acts 13, 44 to 48, the following Shabbat, almost the entire city gathered to hear the word of the Lord. And when the Jews saw the crowds, they were filled with jealousy and began to contradict what was spoken of by Paul. Paul and Barnabas spoke out boldly, saying it was necessary that the word of God be spoken first to the Jews. But since they rejected it and judged themselves unworthy of eternal life, they turned to the Gentiles. And, you know, this this reminds me, okay, this, this reminds me of something. And when... You look at in I have a I have a section on the rev, looking at the rabbinic literature here and, and that's in part three of the study, and one of the major reasons why I look at the rabbinic literature is because there are those who who then they they learn about the rabbinic literature they look at it, and then they turn from faith in Yeshua. And the point is, is that when we look at the rabbinic literature, it shouldn't turn our faith from Yeshua. It's something else that's doing that. It's those who they're talking to, you know, and it's just like what we see here in Acts 13 is that they, uh, it says here that they were, they were filled with jealousy and they began to contradict that what was spoken by Paul and Barnabas. And the, so what you hear today in regarding to Yeshua not being the Messiah You'll find that from from the anti missionaries, as an example, you will find that it is a matter of opinion. Okay, it's a matter of an expectation that is that is uh, perceived of what the Messiah should do. But when we read the biblical text, that's not exactly what he did. You know, he did it in a slightly different way. And so, if people aren't prepared. To understand how the anti-missionaries are going to try to deceive, and we'll talk about that uh, later, and then they'll be unprepared to provide an answer. And um, my point is, is that uh, you know that there are people who will try to destroy faith in in Yeshua, and we have to we have to be prepared. To provide an answer, um, no matter what, you know, no matter what is is presented to us. Anyway, um, I kind of got off topic. Um, so, we're I'm talking about the Gentiles attending synagogue, and then in Acts 14 at Iconium, Paul and Barnabas went as usual into the Jewish synagogue. There they spoke effectively with a great number of Jews and Greeks of non-Jews believed, right? And then in Acts 17, verses 1 through 4, in Thessalonica, Paul and Silas went to the synagogue where Paul reasoned with them from the scriptures, explaining and providing that it was improving, so proving that it was necessary for the Messiah to suffer and to rise from the dead. Some of the Jews were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas, as did a large number of God-fearing Greeks and quite a few prominent women. Okay, and then in Acts 17, verse 17, and in Athens, Paul reasoned in the synagogue, again, with both Jews and God-fearing Greeks, okay? So, uh, as well as the marketplace day by day with those who happen to be there. So, you know, what we we see these references here in the book of Acts indicate that the Gentiles were already coming to the light of the God of Israel. Here we are told how in the synagogue in the diaspora, the Gentiles were attending, indicated by the phrase that there they spoke so effectively that a great number of Jews and Greeks believed, like what we read in Acts 14, verse 1. And in the Gospel of Luke, we read how Simeon, for example, prophesied that Yeshua would be a light for a revelation to the Gentiles, you know, Luke 2, verse 32. And that reflects Isaiah's theme of the nations being drawn to God's salvation. You know, additionally, the, the Apostle Paul in Romans 15, 12 quotes Isaiah to show that the Messiah will rule over the Gentiles who will place their hope in him. You know, these passages reflect the fulfillment of Isaiah's prophecies in the person, in the work of Yeshua, the Messiah, who brings both Jew and Gentiles to the family of God. And note 
The concept of spiritual rebirth and the inclusion of Gentiles into God's people are also themes that can be worked out or backed out from the Isaiah text. You know, what, what is also important to note is how the Isaiah text states that, um, and, and it says here, let's go back, you know, and again, you know, it says here, and the whole thing, okay, this whole thing here, that you will know that I am the Lord, for they shall not be ashamed that wait for me. And again, you know, this is significant. This is a significant part of the verse because it indicates how God calls both Jew and non-Jew, Jew and Gentile. He does not disgrace those who humble themselves and come to him, right? The Lord doesn't say, he doesn't go about the business of telling the people who are lost saying, see, I told you so. You know, God doesn't do that, right? You know, he, he his love and his mercy and grace of God is towards all peoples, right? And it, again, you know, these things indicate how the God of Israel is not tyrannical towards people, right? But he is a loving and he is a caring and he's gentle and he is kind. And he wants all to come to him and to repent, okay? So, next, let's look at the last few verses, 24 to 26, and see what it has to say. Okay, so it says, in verse 24, it says, Ha-yukach migibor malkoach ve'im shevi tzaddik yimelet. Okay, so... Shall will the prey be taken from the mighty or the lawful captive delivered? Or you know, the righteous delivered, right? And Kiko Amar Adonai Gam Shavi Gibor Yukach Umalkoach Aritz Yimelet the et Yarivech Anohi Ariv the et Benayich Anohi Oshia. Okay, so, uh, but thus says the Lord, even the captives of the mighty will be taken away and the prey of the terrible will be delivered for I will contend with him that contends with, with you and I will save your children. And then lastly, it says, V'achalti et monayich et besaram v'kasis damam yishkarun Vayadu kol basar ki ani Adonai Moshiach v'goalech avir Yaakov. Okay, so and I will feed them that oppress you with their own flesh, and they will be drunk with their own blood as with sweet wine, and all flesh will know that I am the Lord, your Savior and your Redeemer, and a mighty one of Jacob. Okay, so... We note again, okay, the the powerful imagery that we have here in these verses here from Isaiah in verses twenty four to twenty six, and the in the deliverance of God. Okay, we note how God says that through Isaiah that He will contend with those who contend with His people, and so this is reminiscent of what is written in Parashat Lech Lecha in uh, the Torah when God calls Abraham. And I'll just, uh, and again, you know, this is Parashat Lech Lecha, and um, right here. And it says, And the Lord said unto Abraham, Get out of thy country from thy kindred and from thy household unto a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great. And you shall be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee and curse him that curses thee. And you will be a um and in you, right, in you, all of the nations of the earth will be blessed, right? And um, so here, the significance of these verses is found in how God's people are treated. We note that this indicates that all of those who have joined themselves with Israel through faith in the Messiah, Yeshua, right? That, that's what the scriptures say. And that we are Gentiles are graft into Israel through Judah because Yeshua was, was from the tribe of Judah. And, and God will contend with those who contends with his people, right? And it does not matter how powerful the enemy, enemy may seem. You know, the Hebrew text uses the word um, in back in uh, Isaiah, 
Yeah, let's go back there. In, in back in Isaiah here, and it uses uh, Megibor, right? And it, like uh, the mighty man or, or the warrior or heroes or strong man, right? And it refers to someone with a great strength or as a warrior. And the rhetorical question that is posed suggests that the of the improbability of making spoils from such a person, you know, because they're so mighty in war. And so, again, this highlights the extraordinary nature of God's deliverance and his power, right? And this, um, the word Malkoach, right here, Malkoach, and that refers to captives or prey and implies something that is seized or captured, often used in the context of war. And so the imagery here is of God reclaiming what has been taken by force. And the word, again, you know, tzaddik, here we see the word tzaddik as a righteous person, a righteous man, implies God's justice is what is at work here. Okay, so this is how the phrase shavit tzaddik is, is used. Okay, um, it's being translated as the captive of the righteous, the captivity of the righteous, right? Suggesting that even those who are righteously taken captive can be delivered by God. And repentance is key to walking in light, as John says, according to 1 John chapter 1, verses 5 through 10. You know, because the promise that was made by God to Abraham and his people, we read God saying that he will arrive, I will contend with your enemies right here. Um, I will contend. Okay, and meaning that God himself will take up the cause against our adversaries, indicating a personal involvement at the deliverance and the deliverance. And he's per, God's personally involved in the deliverance and vindication of his people. So this is an important point. Um, observation, right? And an, an important observation, how God gets personally involved in events in our lives so much so that he promises to that he says that I will I will save right here Ani Oshia you know I will save and this verb is related to salvation and deliverance and emphasizes God's role as a savior and because of the wicked have no mercy God will literally feed them their flesh right and um he will make them to eat their own bodies, right? Meaning that they will be put to death and or they will be starving or something, you know. And the language here describes the outcome for those who took Israel captive as per these verses. And this is a divine judgment and, of the, and destruction, right? And so these actions demonstrate God's supreme power and control over all nations and circumstances. And no power, however mighty, can stand against God. And the Lord God of Israel is faithful in his promises. He promised to be with his people to fight for them and to deliver them, to deliver them. You know, these actions fulfill those promises. And these verses also describes God's character as loving and protective and a just God. And he loves his people, protects them, and brings justice on their behalf. You know, in, in addition, these actions ultimately lead to the glorification of God, as verse 26 states. He says that, and all flesh will know that I am the Lord your God and thy Redeemer, the Mighty One of Jacob, right? And um, right here. And so again, you know, this, this directs us back to Israel, right? You know, and God's deliverance of his people serves to reveal his glory to all the nations, right? And note how the original intent of these verses was to the nation of Israel, and they also have these spiritual implications for all believers in the family of God. You know, they remind us of God's faithfulness, his power to deliver, and his justice. And they assure us that no matter how dire or impossible our circumstances may be, our God is able to deliver us. Now, in the New Testament text, there are themes of exile, return, and restoration as found in Isaiah 49 are, that are there echoed, and in particularly in the writings of Paul and so um, and the Gospel of Luke. So let's look at a few of these examples. So um, right here. And so these themes of exile, return, and restoration in Paul and Luke. Okay, so in Luke 15, verse 11 to 32, it's the parable of the prodigal son. So this parable is a powerful illustration of the theme of exile 
the younger son leaving, returning, his decision to return home and after squandering his the wealth, right? And then God, the or the father representing God, right? Restoring him, bringing him back, right? And restoring him to his position. Again, Luke 24, verse 46, 47, it says, After the resurrection, Yeshua tells his disciples that it was written that the Messiah would suffer and raise from the dead. And on the third day, and repentance and forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. And this can be seen as a reflection of the themes of exile, suffering, and death. Return is resurrection, and then restoration is the preaching of repentance and forgiveness. And in Romans 11, verses 25 and 26, Paul speaks of a mystery that is of the partial hardening that has come upon Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. Into what? Right? Come in to what? You know, into the family of God, right? And um, we are grafted into Israel. And it says, in this way, all Israel will be saved. And this can be seen as a reflection of the theme of exile, the hardening of Israel, and then the eventual restoration of all of Israel. Okay, and then in Galatians 3, verse 28, 29, Paul writes that there is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, for all are one in Christ in Christ Jesus. And if you belong to the Messiah, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. So this speaks to the theme of return and restoration where all believers, regardless of their background, you know, their um, genealogy, right? And they are considered part of God's family and heirs to his promise, right? And again, you know, that there, it says then, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs to the promise. So you know, again, this is this idea of being grafted into Israel. You know, no matter how you look at it, we are grafted into Israel. You know, so we shouldn't hate Israel, right? Um, because this is the the family in which we're we're grafted into. Okay, so these few, few verses here demonstrate how the themes of exile, return, and restoration are that are found in Isaiah forty nine are echoed in the New Testament text. Again, you know, showing this continuity in God's plan for His people throughout the scriptures. So here, the context is very similar, where the exile represents our state of sin and separation from God, and the return signifies our repentance and decision to turn back to God and to his ways. And the restoration symbolizes God's grace and mercy, welcoming us back into his family and restoring us to a right relationship with him without condemnation, right? Because again, remember, it says that those who return to him will not be ashamed, right? Right here, they will not be ashamed. And so this, this is the promise of God. You know, these themes are central to the message of the servant King Messiah in Isaiah. They're also central in the New Testament text concerning Yeshua the Messiah. Okay, so that, that's what I had for the last few verses of Isaiah 49. So next, let's look at the rabbinic commentary and see what, uh, what we can learn.